welcome, bonjour, uh, to a Rock Talk with Mitch LaFon. Uh, joining me on the phone, it is Kings of Dust bassist Craig Chazon. He, of course, played with all kinds of other bands, including, including Badlands, one of these bands that have a very, very strong cult following. Uh, Badlands didn't really do much when they came out, but as people started looking back over the last 20, 25 years, they kept saying, you know what? That album, that debut album was fantastic, and that second album, fantastic. Anyway, uh, we have had all kinds of uh, fun getting to this point today, so I'm just going to get right into this. Here is, without further ado, bassist extraordinaire, le seul et unique, the one and only, Greg Chazon. We are speaking with Greg Chazon. The new band, of course, is Kings of Dust, uh, as we say in Montreal. And, and as you might actually be able to uh, sp- say, understand it, bonjour, comment allez-vous? How are you, Greg? I'm doing great. Yes, yeah, so... And I did, under- I did understand that. Yeah, you see, because uh, I don't think uh, a lot of folks know that you do come from a French-Canadian background. Yeah, I was born in Toronto, moved to the United States when I was five, but my father spoke fr- uh, French-Canadian, so when, when him and his family got together, and it was a huge family, uh, 19 kids, and if they got together, they all spoke uh, French-Canadian French. So, like an idiot, I took French in school thinking I would be able to understand them. No. No, not at all. Were were you, were they from, uh, I mean, if they're French-Canadian, were they all from Quebec, or were they like sort of the French-Canadians from Ontario and the French-Canadians from Manitoba, or were they, or were you were Montreal-based? No, I think they're more uh, uh, Ontario-based. My dad's from St. John's, New Brunswick. Uh, my grandmother was from Prince Edward Island. My mom's from Nova Scotia. So, um, and they have, you know, French in their background. And so um, my dad has a, had a serious Montreal connection because he was a serious Montreal Canadiens fan. <laughs> See, that that is a smart thing. And, and I've mentioned this before on the podcast, growing up in the 70s, the neighbor was Ken Dryden, the uh, the goalie for the Montreal Canadiens. Oh, so your, your dad would have loved that. Did, and we'll get to the music in a second. Did you, after you moved away at the age of five, did you ever come back here and spend, you know, six months in Toronto or, or three months in Montreal? Did you ever come back to Canada and just spend some time here? When I was a little kid, we went on a vacation and spent oh, maybe a month in different parts of Canada. And, uh, and of course, when I was in Badlands and we toured, you know, we spent time in Canada, but it might only be a couple of days in Montreal, a couple of days in Toronto, a couple, a day in Winnipeg, whatever. So, um, and then I was back in Red Dragon Cartel as well. So I enjoy it there. Um, the only thing I don't like about up there is it snows. <laughs> hey, snowed yesterday. So, no. Yeah. Terrible. All right, but let, let's, you, go ahead. I was going to tell you a, a funny story. I hadn't seen snow in a long time in, in 2000. 14 when i was on tour with uh red dragon cartel it was snowing in toronto really heavy so i walked outside to kind of experience it and the first thing i did is slip and fall right in my back in the middle of the sidewalk and all the people are walking by looking at me like rookie <laughs> yeah i know what that is i, I actually fell uh, a couple of days ago on my on my head walking the dog and bashed my head right it bounced my head bounced off the uh the grass like a basketball but let's uh let us get on to to what to what we all. Yeah, I know. I was like, Ugh. but that that was the arrogance of being here. I, I walked out uh, with the dog in slippers, and it uh, didn't work. But um, <laughs> but let's talk Kings of Dust here. You of course you you mentioned Red Dragon Cartel. You've done Badlands and a bunch of other bands, but for the most part, those bands featured you know, the other guys, and it was other bands, uh, though Badlands is probably your band, but is Kings of Dust just this one record, and thank you very much, and we move on, or are you really starting up a new band, and you're going to go through that whole rigmarole of getting out on the road, and, and working it the old way, and, and what do you, how do you sort of see Kings of Dust moving forward? Uh, Kings of Dust is definitely a band, and it's not a, a one-off thing. I mean, it's been going on for a while and there's been different uh, versions of it with different people. But the version that we have right now has been together for, I don't know, three or four years. And um, the only reason it took so long to put it out is because I had to go through my cancer treatment. And that kind of took everything off for almost four years. Um, so we are actually writing for another 
another release at the moment. We have a half a dozen songs written, and the plan is for us to go on the road. As a matter of fact, we just canceled uh, three weeks worth of dates uh, going through Texas and Oklahoma, and then there was a couple people that were interested in us going back east, so we were working on trying to arrange some shows to do that. And then there was even a thing in Japan that has been put on hold now because of, uh, you know, what's going on, uh, the climate in, in the world these days. So, uh, once all that clears up, yes, we will we'll go on the road. I don't think I'll get in a tour bus for six months, but I could see us going out two, two or three week slashes here and there. And, uh, you know, interesting, interesting gigs here and there. So the plan is to take it out and play it live. We've actually never done a live show, so we're kind of dying to do one. And we had a couple shows in Phoenix and Tucson that also got canceled. So right now we're like every other band, just waiting for, uh, for the world to get better so uh, we can go about our business. Yeah, that, that's one of the challenges, you know, with this COVID-19 going around is a lot of bands put out albums. And of course, the important thing is to put out an album and go tour it. And now you can't, you know, there's a, there's a band I love called Gothard. They just put out an album called uh, 13 and they were going to go out on tour. And now the tour starts in January of 2021. So it's, it's literally eight, nine months after the release, which in normal circumstances you go, you can't tour eight months after a release, forget that. But that's sort of where we're at right now. Does that make it more complicated for you? Or do you see it as a benefit where, okay, we're not on the road. Let's get this second record done, and then when we go tour, we'll have, you know, 20 songs to choose from rather than 10 songs to choose from. I think that's definitely a possibility. I mean, depending on how long this goes. I mean, we were actually rehearsing for the live show, and then I just put everything on hold and said, uh, look, let's not even bother with these songs. And, and, as, and we were going to shoot a, uh, an actual video uh, for one of the songs, um, uh, what's the other we were going to shoot a video for it and i actually said let's just postpone that and what we'll do is when the world gets better again we'll shoot the video then depending on how long this takes and then we'll release the video and kind of get a little bit of a, a bump from that we released our record on march 13th friday the 13th which is the same day that uh i believe that's the same day that a national emergency or whatever was uh declared here so you know i'm surprised that we weren't completely lost in the shuffle i mean we have gotten a lot of responses from it and everything's been positive but talk about friday the 13th and a weird weird time for this to happen you know to be putting out a record not for the virus that's weird anyway but so if it takes till 2021 we probably will record another record in this fall and then we'll put that one out too and um you know like you said have 20 songs to choose from as opposed to just one record does having a band with somebody like you with a pedigree make it easier to sort of get noticed by promoters and by record, you know, record buying public? Or do you really see this as a challenge of we're a new band and we got to go through the new band growing pains, trying to get the name out there, trying, you know, how much of the association with your name helps and how much is it really going to be back to the basics and just working it, working it, working it? I think it's, uh, a, you know, a little six and one half dozen of the other. I mean, having my resume certainly doesn't help because, you know, I'm, I'm known from my, you know, association with Badlands and Red Dragon Cartel primarily. And <clears throat> there's a lot of built in fan base from that, especially because of the time I spent with Red Dragon Cartel in 2014, you know, social media is so huge that, uh, um, I went from being off the grid to way on the grid in a pretty short time. And, and uh, because of social media and because of the way Kings of Dust has been structured, we've managed to kind of stay on point with that. Um, but by the same token, we are a new band and, you know, we're going to have to go out there and prove ourselves like any other band does, like Badlands did when they were a new band, like Red Dragon did. We have to do the same thing. And if we can't deliver the goods live, it's not going to really matter um, you know, what my resume was, uh, it, we still have to go out and prove that we're, uh, worthy of people buying the record and that we can, uh, perform this stuff live. I mean, you've heard the record, so it's, it's pretty seventies blues based hard rock with a lot of jamming and that sort of thing, long solos and intricate parts and time changes. 
we have to pull that off live, and I believe we will. Yeah, I, I think you will too. And, and I really do like the album because it, it really is. I think it's it's really filling a void these days. We we've got so many bands trying to sort of recreate the seventies and eighties and and their glory days, and you've got a lot of you know pop and all that other stuff. But this one is just straightforward, and 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 I love that that just. Anyway, uh, talk to me about that in terms of, uh, in terms of musical style. W- going back to that very basic, straightforward rock, d- do you have to worry about what's going on out there? Do you have to worry about, oh, well, it's got to sound a little bit like Red Dragon or it's got to sound a little bit like Badlands? Or was it very freeing to, to, to just sort of come up with your own Kings of Dust music? I never really worried about what anyone else thought it would be. I mean... Uh... My influences are my influences. The way that we write is the way that we write. And um, we're all a little bit older. I'm influenced by the 70s music. That's the generation I grew up in. Uh, I know that a lot of people say that it has a certain Badlands sort of flavor. And that's just strictly because Jake's influences are the same as mine. You know, Jake's a big fan of 70s hard rock. So am I. Um, That's one of the things that kind of made us bond together as, you know, musicians and friends. Um, so, you know, when I was writing this record and when we were writing it, you know, a lot of the songs kind of come out of my head first and then we get together and work and make them into songs. But, you know, if I had a, if I heard something by Deep Purple or Mountain or Humble Pie or whatever, and I heard something that interested me, whether it be now or way back then, Maybe that ended up in the song. Maybe that flavor, maybe some of that Zeppelin flavor ended up in there. Maybe there's some Sabbath flavor. I mean, I've heard everything. I had a girl today send me a message saying uh, she just heard the new lyric video for uh, the song, Yeah, That's Me. And she said, I really like the Saxon style riff. And I, I thought I would have never heard that in there. But if that's what she hears, that's fine with me. But I think it's more 70s based than anything else. And, and um, I don't think we ever really worried about you know, how long the songs are, they're all over four minutes long, whether this, whether it's got one guitar solo or three, it's just whatever we felt like writing is what we wrote. And I will say that's very similar to Badlands. Badlands was like, we weren't really concerned about what anyone else got out of it. We wrote the stuff that we liked. We kind of wrote for ourselves. And if other people liked it, the more the merrier. And that's kind of what's happening with Kings of Dust. The people seem to like it. I'm happy the fact that they get something out of it. You're right. The seventies is, it's kind of, uh, the seventies are the new 2000, 2020s, I guess. Everyone wants to do a seventies thing and there's a lot of bands doing it, but we come at it from a very authentic, real sort of place because that's where we grew up. Yeah. That's a, and it's a great, it, listen, it was a great place to grow up. All, all right. So I'm going to, I'm going to ask you some of the uh, typical Badlands questions. Cause I, 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 you know, you have to, um, sure. but you know, the, the first album comes out, uh, around 1989. You've got, you know, Motley Crue with a Dr. Feel Good. You've got Def Leppard off the coming off of Hysteria onto, uh, their other, uh, Adrenalized. You've got, of course, uh, Injustice for All Metallica. You've got these big bands doing these big albums. What were some of the challenges you faced getting a new band into that marketplace at the time? Was it just, you know, very crowded and it was hard to find your way? Or did the record company champion you and say, hey, this band is great. Let's let's get them on these tours. Let's get them in front of these publics. How was it back then for you to, to get noticed? Because everybody now in 2020 goes, man, Badlands was great. That first album was great. It's a classic. But in 1989... You know, the conversation was, hey, have you heard the new Dr. Feelgood? Hey, have you heard Injustice for... Like, it was. It must have been difficult, right? It was, but we were so different than anyone else. I mean, uh, a lot of bands were kind of saying they were going to do that, the same kind of stylistic music that we were doing, but we were one of the bands, and I think Blue Murder would be another one, that really kind of stuck to our guns and um, w- weren't really concerned with what was going on at the time. We definitely weren't a hair metal band. We weren't trying to be a commercial band. We weren't trying to write for the radio or MTV. We just kind of did it uh, and did what we wanted. We made the record we wanted to make at that time. The advantage we had was we had the big Atlantic machine behind us. So, you know, there was guaranteed of touring and and magazines and MTV and all that kind of stuff. And uh, 
a lot of people would always say that, you know, we were kind of a, a breath of fresh air in that market. Not that there was anything wrong with that market. It's just that we were doing something a little bit different, kind of, you know, like the first Black Crows record when they came out, they were doing something completely different than anyone else did. And, um, you know, they were really trying to do that Rod Stewart in the faces kind of humble pie sort of thing. And they were very successful with it. We wanted to do something that was music that was kind of near and dear to our hearts. Jake had all these ideas and he's the main writer on all that stuff. And, you know, every day was kind of like a new adventure as far as what he was writing and the public seemed to like it. Listen, the, the, the public really seemed to, 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 to love it. Now, uh, the the albums, of course, as you've mentioned in other interviews, haven't been re-released because of the relationship with Atlantic. Uh, talk to me a little bit about that relationship, because you just mentioned that you did have the machine to get you on tours, but right now you don't have that machine to sort of re-release them. Where did it sort of go south with them, and and is there a way to repair it so that we can get these albums out? Oh, uh, I don't know. I mean, it's kind of... We don't own the rights to it. Jake doesn't own the rights to it because we never recouped our money. I mean, so there was obviously a disconnect with Atlantic by the time we made our second record. We were not the uh, flavor of the month anymore with Atlantic. Uh, Skid Row had come out and they were the big deal there. And that's fine. Uh, We still had a lot of people that championed us over at Atlantic. But um, we were the kind of band that Atlantic had certain things they wanted us to do. And one of them was they wanted us to record... uh, Vandenberg's burning heart for our second record and we just wouldn't do it Jake said nah screw that we'll write our own stuff or we'll we'll do a cover of something that we like which ended up being fire and rain and so it's not that we intentionally tried to piss Atlantic off and and it was also Jason Flom who was our A&I A&R guy who is now the head of Atlantic um it's just that we had our own plan and we followed our own plan and I think uh we were not, uh, I don't think they appreciated the fact that we wouldn't jump through any hoops for them. And we just kind of kicked the hoop to the side and did whatever we wanted. So I know there's a lot of talk about why this, then that, and why it's never coming out. I think it's a combination of things. And I think one of the reasons why is because uh, we were not Atlantic's favorite band at that point. Well, so so let me ask you this, because they did change the Copyright Act a few years ago, and I, you know, whatever it is, after 25 years or 30 years, a band can ask for their master's best or, or something like that. I mean, I, I, don't quote me on the details, but is there a point where you're actually going to be able to get the master's back, or are they tied up in such horrible recoupment that you won't be able to get them back? To be perfectly honest, I don't know. I don't know what the deal is with it. I don't know what the time limit is, and if if there is no time limit, I mean, if there is a time limit, the fact that uh, whether we recouped or not, I don't know what that has to, you know, how that plays into it. So um, since Badlands, I mean, it was a band that we were all equal, but it's it was Jake's band. And, you know, if Jake, you know, decides to go after that, I would support whatever it is that he wanted to do. I mean, him and I are still friends. We still talk. Um, I went to his wedding last year in October and, uh, I consider him like a brother to me and I, I know he does as well. So um, whatever Jake wanted to do, I would be on board with. I just don't know what the legal options are. And because I'm trying, I'm, try- I'm actually trying to-, trying to search it up for you because I know, I know they changed the, uh, the thing here, but I'm just trying to see what it says. And ter- but I'll g- keep, keep answering and I'll, I'll have an answer for you in a second. Well, I just think that Jake doesn't spend a whole lot of time thinking about that. And I know I don't either. He's got Red Dragon Cartel. That's his baby. He likes it. Um, I think he likes the band a lot. I think he's proud of it. He's the main architect of it, you know, him and Anthony. And I got Kings of Dust. I'm very happy with it. Um, I'm the main architect of it. But Michael Beck, my singer, and I have been working on this thing for over seven years. And then Ryan McKay guitarist and jimmy taft drummer they've been involved for four years they're all excellent musicians we have a great working relationship we're actually friends i mean uh, if we were able to hang out these days but since we have to be you know uh self-quarantined we don't even hang out but uh um i think when this all clears up i think uh i'll be really happy to uh get back to work with these guys there you go. Now, I'm looking at a, a New York Times article that was written in 2011. It says from then 
that artist had to wait 35 years before uh, having termination rights and getting the uh, masters back. So, so we got a ways to go. Then. You got you got a ways to go. Uh, just quickly, uh, let's talk a little bit about Ray Gillen. That that guy, that singer, holy mackerel, one of the best. Um, uh, just talk to me about working with him when you when when you heard his voice how how did he get into the band were were you four guys sort of hanging around did did, did you uh, hold, hold auditions how did the band come together and when you heard him sing that first time what was sort of your reaction because it, it just it, it was a voice not like others um well jake and i had been friends i auditioned for ozzy uh in scotland for the ultimate sin record. And I didn't get the gig cause I didn't think I had the correct look for what was going on. And he's probably right. Um, but Jake and I kind of became friends there and we realized we had a lot of stuff in common. So when he would come off the road or even when he was on the road, he'd call me at night, and just talk. Or when he'd come in town, we'd get together, he'd come over to my house and, uh, my girlfriend, now my wife would make dinner and, and, uh, we'd hang out and we kind of became good friends when he left, uh ozzy he told me he was going to put something together and uh i know that someone had sent him ray's tape and jake just kind of blew it off i think that i just wasn't really motivated enough to do it then finally ray's mother called and said are you going to check out my kid or not so i think jake's thing was well, man if this guy's mom's going to be calling me i better check him out so i think he liked what was on the tape and then sent and had ray come out to la Eric Singer was here as well. Uh, Eric lived here. So they got together in the three of them and they played. And uh, I know Jake was really very blown away by it. Uh, Jake and I were going out to BC Rich a couple of days later, the guitar company to talk to them. And uh, they sent a limo for us of all things. And uh, in the limo, he said, do you want to hear this cassette of this singer? And I said, sure. And he played it for me. I was like, holy crap. It was just a rehearsal tape of them playing. It wasn't even any songs. It was just them jamming and Ray kind of, you know, making up stuff as he went along. There might have been a couple cover riffs in there, but I thought, I said, this is like one of the best singers I've ever heard. And I said, by the way, the damn drummer's pretty good too. And he said, yeah, I was thinking the same thing. So I think the three of them kind of got it together uh, pretty quickly. And then they decided to audition bass players. So, um, you know, I auditioned along with 45 other guys. Uh, I will say that if Ray hadn't been the guy, I'm sure he would have, Jake would have auditioned, auditioned singers and drummers. But the fact that he found uh, Ray and Eric right out of the gate sure made the process a lot simpler. The only hard process was, you know, finding me. <laughs> the 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 Ray and Eric stuff together, those must have been the, the Black Sabbath demos then that, that, he, that Ray must have been listening to. I mean, uh, Jake must have been listening to. I think there was some of that, and I think there was some, uh, maybe some dem, some of the stuff that Ray did in Ron Donnelly. Um, oh, right, I, I don't right, rem right. I don't remember now. That was a while ago, so I can't say for sure. Um, but I know that it probably was really good. But the stuff that Ray sang to what Jake was writing in those first auditions and those first rehearsals was way better than I'd heard him sing with anything else he's ever done. I I've heard the stuff he did with Blue Murder, and I heard the stuff he did with Sabbath and, and, uh, uh, the, uh, Mel Galley, what is it? Phenomenon and all that. It's great stuff, but the stuff he sang with Badlands, that was Ray's true voice. That's where he sounded the best. That's where he felt the music the best. It was, uh, it's like a perfect match for what, what Jake wrote. Ray was the perfect match for it. And then you throw what, uh, Eric and, and myself did in there. It really kind of was, uh, lightning in a bottle almost it really was all right so so the first album comes out it goes all the way to number 57 on on the billboard uh, 200 album charts which is actually pretty good for a debut album and then uh, eric singer says listen i'm gonna go and join kiss now on one hand you gotta go well it's kiss he's, he's not gonna go join some schmucky band it's 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 kiss but on the other band, it sort of kills the momentum. Now you got to go find a new drummer. It's going to affect the sound a bit. Talk to me about that moment where you heard about the decision and then you sort of said, oh, Christ, now what? Um, how how, how well, pinnacle was The decision wasn't made by Eric. It was made by the band. At the time, uh, the band and Eric really wasn't 
seeing eye to eye on a number of levels. So uh, we made the decision to part company with Eric. And um, so it wasn't that he quit. We kind of said, look, this isn't, we're not all heading in the same direction anymore. We don't all want this. We don't all want the same thing. Three of us want one thing. You seem to want something a little different. You know, um, you should go off and explore that because we want to kind of stay the course of what we're doing. So he orig- the first thing he did is he joined Alice Cooper. So he's part of Alice Cooper for a while. And then he hooked up with Kiss because he had played drums on Paul Stanley's uh, solo tour that, that he had done right when Badlands first got together. So, I mean, Eric is a great drummer. He's a great guy. He wrote some of the best drum parts ever. And I'm sure that uh, he's happy where he's at. Obviously, he's been in Kiss longer than any other drummer's ever been in there. And so that was probably the right gig for him. I mean, he's, you know, he's a rock star and a millionaire and, and I run a guitar store. So it was the right decision for <laughs> right. him. <laughs> right decision for him. Um, but it was also the right decision for us. I, it, I, it, we were kind of at the point with where it was going to be diminished returns. And, and it would have been the same way if it had been me or Ray. If, if I had just wanted something different than what we originally started out doing in Badlands, I could see where they would have said, you know what, you should go do this. And we would have said the same thing to Ray. It was just our, our vision never changed from what we started out as, and I think Eric's did, and I don't think we were as successful as Eric uh, was hoping that we would have been, and I think for the rest of us, at that particular time, we weren't really too concerned with how successful we were. We were going to make another record, and uh, we had a two-album deal, so we weren't too concerned about it. We were going to make the next record, and it would be a pre- it would be a progression in our minds from the first record. So um, it was a decision that was made. Do I know if it was the right decision or not? Probably from, it probably did change things because the original four guys is always better, but getting Jeff Martin in the band really was a big kick in the butt for us. And it really helped us move forward as well. So it's kind of like a double-edged sword. Right. And, and I guess at this point, 2020, having Eric in there, who's been the kiss drummer, like you said, the longest, it does pique the interest of Kiss fans to go back and check it out, and so so I guess it helps too. Um, and just just before we 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 wrap up in uh, 2015, you had this uh, long uh, battle with uh, tongue cancer. You beat it. How are you doing health wise these days? Is it is it at bay with a risk of coming back, or is it completely defeated? And you know how how are you just physically? I'm fine. I mean, my cancer was stage four tongue cancer, but it was brought on by a virus called HPV, which is the same way that Bruce Dickinson got his and Ricky Rocket and Tom Hamilton and Dave Mustaine and Michael Douglas all got cancer that way. The uh, cancer in the mouth is terrible. But the one caveat to having that kind of cancer is that it's uh, the success rate of it never coming back is between 85 and 95 percent, where if it, as if it was nicotine related, you have a 50 percent survival rate. So I'm feeling pretty good about it. And uh, I've been cancer free. My last treatment was October 4th, 2015. I haven't had any reoccurrence and I don't think I will. And um, I always kind of keep a positive attitude and just kind of move forward. I'm just trying to push the pile a little bit forward every day. Yeah, well, I, I'm looking forward to to more Kings of Dust. And, and folks, if you haven't heard this album yet, do go check it out. I know a lot of you have a lot of time right now. And if you really want to fill it in with a good 45, 50 minutes of, of just solid rock, uh, Kings of Dust uh, is uh, fits, fills that void properly. So, uh, so there you go. And, and hopefully we'll get a, a new one a new new one uh, shortly after because uh, like a lot of artists, we're all sort of stuck inside with plenty of time to write and test out some riffs and (laughs) and be creative, right? You got got to spend this time creatively. That's what we're doing right now is uh, just writing songs and we have some uh, great material. Like I said, uh, the guys in the band are great musicians and uh, uh, definitely the best band I could be in uh, it, this is it's just a great setting as far as every possible aspect of it. So, you know, hopefully, um, you know, we'll get to tour on this record. But if not, we'll tour on the next record and throw some stuff in for this. I would add that we have a, a 
a new music uh, lyric video out for Yeah, That's Me. It goes with the one we also had before, which was Like an Ocean. So you can find some stuff on YouTube if you're looking to hear kind of what we sound like. And you can get the record in a lot of uh, record stores or on Amazon and that kind of thing. So we are selling it, and it's actually selling pretty well. So I just want to go play, man. I know. I know. I, I, I actually just want to go to concerts. My My entire month of May calendar today, I was told is gone. I had a festival to go to and I had different shows and the shows sort of fell one by one, but now the festival's fallen too. And it's just like, oh, okay. <laughs> it's a weird, it's a, it's a weird time. I mean, it, it's, uh, but you know what? The human race will band together and we'll beat this. It won't matter what your political persuasion is, what your, you know, ethnic background is, what your religious background is. None of that matters. We're all humans. We all have to work together we'll beat this thing and then we'll move forward. I mean, that's just the way it's always been. Yep. That's the way it will be. I don't believe in conspiracies. It, this is what it is. And we just have to work together to get over it. I fully agree. And I'll just finish on this. I saw a, a TV show last night where they talked about all the innovations that were brought on after disasters and, and, you know, the exactly. flus. And I was just looking at, looking at all this stuff that was invented. I'm going, Wow, the next five years are going to be freaking fantastic. So, so you know, I agree. so there, there's always a silver lining and uh, we will get through it. But until we get through it, Kings of Dust will help you get through it, folks. Do take a listen. And uh, on that, merci beaucoup. Thank you so much. Thanks, Mitch. This has been Rock Talk with Mitch LaFon. For more exclusive content and interviews, subscribe on iHeartRadio, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, on YouTube, and many more. Follow Mitch on all the socials, especially Twitter, at Mitch LaFon, and on Instagram, at Mitch underscore LaFon. Get your Mitch merch now at loudtracks.com slash Mitch.